Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Sonoma County Master Gardener Zoom Talks. I'm Nancy Krebling, a Master Gardener from the class of 2009, and I'll be your moderator today. This talk is being recorded. It will soon be available on the Sonoma Master Gardener's YouTube channel, along with many of our other interesting programs. This talk is another in our ongoing collaboration with the um, Sonoma County Regional Library. As you probably are aware, for many years, each branch in the library system hosted garden talks throughout the year in person on a wide variety of topics for the home gardener. The talks promote our master gardener ethos of sustainability and science-based information. However, since COVID-19, like so many other organizations, we have switched to this online format and are pleased to be continuing our collaboration with the library system. We encourage you to explore our website and our Facebook page and learn more about the University of California's Master Gardener program, the resources we have available to help you with your garden and information on how you can become a Master Gardener here in Sonoma County. So, so just a couple housekeeping items before we get started with our presentation today. If for some reason you use you lose your Zoom connection, just click on your link again and you can get back in. If uh, you have questions, and we hope you do, please submit them through the Q&A box. It's often at the bottom of your screen. Right now it's at the top of my screen. So um, it, it's labeled Q&A and that's the place where we'll be looking for your questions. You can submit your questions at any time and our speaker, Bill Klausing, will be answering questions at um, certain breaks in the program. So you might not have to wait all the way till the end to get an answer to your question. Uh, we also have special links and other information presented in the chat box. So, uh, and right now, Cleo has added um, a lot of the links to the information that Bill will be sharing with you in the chat box. So you can copy that out. Um, and as a final reminder, we are recording this presentation. And now it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Bill Klausing, whose topic today is Native Trees of the North Bay. Um, Bill's been a Sonoma County Master Gardener since 2011. His professional career was in acute health care, but he's been an avid gardener, gardener for several decades. Maybe that's the stress relief aspect of gardening. Huh? Um, he moved to Sonoma County in um, 2008, and he had to kind of relearn and get re-inspired by um, the difference in the gardening in Sonoma County between the Midwest where he was from. So he's had a gardening re-education, and now he's um, an enthusiastic um, disciple of native plants and native trees, and I'm sure you're going to love this presentation. So, Bill, take it away. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, Nancy, if you could just make sure to give me a verbal confirmation when I share screen that it successfully sure. goes, of if you would. Mm -hmm. There we go. You're on. Okay. Good morning to everybody. Um, I got started uh, on on this uh, putting together this little talk, um, sort of out of uh, uh, necessity. Uh, we didn't have anybody in our organization that spoke specifically about native trees, and since I already uh, was putting together presentations about uh, native plantings. Uh, I volunteered to undertake this about a year and a half ago. And so um, what you're seeing today is really sort of a culmination of that. And although I, I certainly tweaked the slide deck um, this week, it will continue to change and morph over time. This is my last, hopefully my last bad pun of the day, gardening in tree dimensions. Um, when, when you think of your landscape uh, in your home garden, 
We spend a lot of time focusing on wildflowers and perennials, low growing things. Um, but remember to look to the sky uh, as, as you uh, raise that plant canopy up off of the ground. Uh, you know, it's the difference between X squared and X cubed as to how much space you have for wildlife. Trees are, uh, of course, nature's most efficient atmospheric scrubbers. Um, there's a lot of people who are uh, espousing, you know, trying to plant enough trees to uh, overcome combat climate change, although that is uh, really a tall task for trees to do. Um, but trees are most efficient primarily because they have so much more surface area, so many more leaves, uh, even if it's a shrub. And we'll talk about large shrubs today as well as trees. Um, some tree species um, are frequently identified as keystone species in ecosystems. And, uh, and that is the case here in Sonoma County. Most people consider our native oaks as keystone species um, in our local uh, microclimates, in most of our mo local microclimates. Now, I had run across this information some time ago, and then I finally found a, uh, a scientific uh, support for it that uh, the most Im impactful tree genus, genera, um, for habitat support are these four, Quercus, Prunus, Salix, and Populus. And um, that is simply uh, a, a factor of the amount of wildlife that these trees uh, can support uh, in an ecosystem. Now, I ran across this uh, little poster, which I borrowed. This is a nonprofit organization uh, out of the New York City area. Uh, but I thought it gave a really good example, uh, a, a good visual representation of what is in your garden, what is in your yard, uh, and uh, to encourage people that they want to support all of these creatures. And, you know, the, the science in the ecology of, of native plantings, native trees, is a relatively new um, science, a lot of research currently going on. But one of the things that uh, has been established is that, uh, and, and we, we, we see that locally in vineyards that plant a row of native flowers along the edge of a vineyard um, or uh, uh, to increase habitat support, support pollinators <clears throat> and so on. But a few scattered native trees will do the same thing for you, just because the amount of uh, wildlife support in a tree uh, is exponentially higher um, than smaller plants. And why focus on native trees? Well, uh, for three primary reasons why we focus on native trees. Um, they are the best at promoting biodiversity, uh, they will be the most sustainable in your local uh, climate, microclimate ecosystem, and they clearly are the best at providing habitat support. Now, uh, I'm just going to back up a second. This, the first part of my presentation is sort of going to focus on a, a, a bit of science before I get into uh, specifics about um, individual species of trees and shrubs. Now, the advantages of having a native plant materials, this is a publication from the USDA. Uh, native plantings are unlikely to be invasive or overly competitive, competitive with other native plants. They provide food sources for all the creatures that can live in your garden. It will reduce energy consumption, pollution, and important here, water use, uh, reduces the need for pesticides, and fertilizers, no native plants here in Sonoma County should require any additional fertilizer application to your garden. Uh, native plants protect at-risk species. And of course, we've talked about biodiversity uh, as well. Now, one of the things uh, 
many of you are probably already familiar with um, Dr. Tallamy, Doug Tallamy, um, who is from the East Coast. And uh, he's an entomologist by training. And uh, he, he got into this world of uh, gardening uh, sort of by accident after he and his wife bought their first property. Uh, I think it was about 20 acres of land, the house and surrounding uh, woodlands. And of course, because he was an entomologist and he's interested in specifically insects and bugs, it, it didn't take him very long to realize that there were most of the thing, most of the plants and trees on his property didn't have any insect life. But the plants that were native did. This is his first pub published book. It's a very easy read. I encourage anybody to uh, read it. It's available at the public library. Uh, this is a, a quote from his book that, you know, the home gardener has become an important player in the management of our nation's wildlife. Now that seems like a daunting task. Um, he has also published a second book uh, which focuses uh, on uh, trying to enlist uh, homeowners citizens uh, to build a, what he calls a homegrown national park in, in your backyard. Now, these true native plants, uh, 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 native trees that I'll be talking about today, they're best suited to our local soils. Uh, many of them grow um, in a variety of soils, whether you have sandy loam, uh, as we have here in certain parts of the county, as well as the heavy clay that you can also encounter. Uh, these native plants have had centuries to adapt to climate conditions. Uh, this isn't their first um, dry decade. The, uh, native plants have been through uh, centuries of, of drier than normal uh, weather. And these native plants will be most attracted to native wildlife. Uh, this is a, a really good example uh, a little research. This is uh, one of the eucalyptus species that it's planted here in California, which we imported uh, from down under. And uh, uh, this particular species in its native Australia hosts 47 insect species. But that same tree only hosts one insect species here in California. And when I talk about hosting an insect species, um, that just doesn't mean that the uh, insect visits, that means the, the um, insect's life is in that tree, raise their offspring, lay their eggs, their larvae feed there, and so on. Now, uh, there's, you know, there's some really jarring information out there that 40%, according to National Geographic, 40% of insect species are in decline. Um, this study from um, the Yale School of Forestry, one in eight bird species is threatened with global extinction. Um, you know, these are things that catch my attention. Uh, we hear a lot about bees and butterflies specifically, um, but those insect species uh, are further afield than bees and butterflies. Uh, the Smithsonian Institute even came up with a position paper that said that the home gardener should prioritize native plants to support songbird populations. Um, so, you know, this is a movement that really is sort of only in its uh, infancy, so to speak. Um, when, when you look at uh, uh, the majority of things that are available in nurseries and that are planted, I believe I saw a statistic that um, that over 50% of the uh, uh, purchases for the home garden are plants that are native to Asia and not even native to North America. So we clearly have a ways to go in that regard. Uh, this is a, a quote from um, Calscape, um, which I hopefully will show you that website, the Calscape website later on at the end of my presentation. Non-native plants can seldom be host plants for native insect herbivores 
because the native plants can't get past, or the native insects, excuse me, cannot get past the chemical and structural defenses of the plants that come from other continents. Um, they are only willing to host, use as host plants, uh, those which they have co-evolved over the decades and centuries. Now, this is a this 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 uh, uh, might seem a little uh, trite for some folks, but but I think it's very illuminating when you think about it uh, from from the very basic sort of biology uh, botany lesson. Uh, green plants they are the only thing on the planet that can convert the sunlight into sugar and oxygen, and all of the rest of the life on the planet depends upon that activity. Now those green plants feed those first level insect herbivores. Uh, and these are called trophic levels as you move up the food chain, as the energy in the planet moves upward. And the key is to do this efficiently from the first trophic level that's feeding insect herbivores to the next level, which is predatory insects and beneficial insects. And as you examine um, the insects that might be in your garden, a good example, we all know that a lady beetle is, is, a, is a beneficial insect. We love having them in their garden because they eat aphids. But you know, the lady beetle also has larvae that eats leaves. So the lady beetle does really lives at two levels, two trophic levels. But as you move up the food chain to the next trophic level, then you are feeding birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals. And I found this visual representation online. And I thought this, this really gave you a, a, a snapshot view of how this works. And you know we're focusing at that very bottom level, the producers, the green plants. And uh, you see that little patch of what uh, looks like a uh, turf, um, but the, the greenery that is represented in that lowest level of this triangle, if those were all non-native plants, you would have to have probably 30 or 40 fold the number of plants to supply food for that next level up. So that when you use non-native plants in your home garden, you're creating an inefficiency um, for mother nature. Uh, um, the, the more native plants that you have, the more easily you feed upward in the food chain. Now, um, this is a, uh, a handout that I think um, got sent to everybody and um, I'll talk about this. I, I hope you will be able to refer to this. Um, there are a few trees and shrubs on this list that I uh, that have been added to my presentation that are not on this spreadsheet. Um, but you can see on this spreadsheet, uh, you will have genus and species. You will have a common name for that shrub or tree, whether it's deciduous or evergreen, a max height, I didn't include max width, although that is a consideration clearly for your garden space. Growth rate, water needs, which is clearly an important factor here in Sonoma County, and um, sun requirements and any special considerations. And I will take a little time out here, Nancy, if there are any questions that I need to address before I move on into specific um, species of trees and shrubs. Uh, we just have one question so far, and um, Deborah wants to know, how do we amend the soil when planting a native tree or shrub? Generally speaking, native trees should not, and native plantings in general, should not require any amending of soil. Now, I do cheat a little bit. I mix a little compost into my pit. Um, when I plant just 
so that my soil is a little more uh, workable, nicer, easier for those little roots um, to get started with. Uh, but they really should not need any uh, amending. The uh, one of the concerns uh, with the use of natives, with the planting of natives, is that if you over amend the soil here in Sonoma County, uh, you could discourage the ability for those native plants to thrive uh, because those native plants have been living um, using just the natural amendments that come from leaf litter, uh, stems, things that fall on the ground. Uh, you saw that picture earlier about leave the leaves uh, because that is really all the sort of extra nutrients um, that native plants would need here in Sonoma County. I see another couple questions popped into the box, Nancy. Yeah, Wendy has a quest, or a request. When you talk about specific species, would you kindly point out uh, any that are not countywide, as Sonoma seems to have such a vast number of microclimates? And, and, and I will address some of that because there are some specific plants that are more coastal as opposed to, you know, the inland hills and valleys. And, um, but I'll also um, show you where you can uh, hopefully access, learn to access that information uh, uh, on your own. Okay, and then um, there was, a question about providing the spreadsheet that you're showing and um, we'll be sending it to everybody or the link to it um, to everybody when we send you the link to the Facebook um, recording of this um, of this Zoom talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So everybody will get this. I don't, is it available on our website now, Bill? Yeah, it's in VMS, but I, it's not on the uh, public facing pages on our website that I know of. Sounds like it, it'll be a great resource when we get it posted there. Yeah, I, I, I think some amendments over time will happen before we officially post it. Okay. Okay, and I think. Anything else? Okay, I'm moving on. Yep. So um, we have all of these, it, and uh, these are all the things that are on that spreadsheet, common name, dormancy, height, growth rate, et cetera. And, but the, the, one of the number one considerations is of course, right plant, right place. Uh, that includes um, the size of your property. It depends, it, that also includes where your property is located. Um, you know, whether you live in, you know, bodega as opposed to um, the Alexander Valley are, are, are completely different uh, uh, climates by any stretch of the imagination. And so uh, that spreadsheet, when you see it, uh, that I just displayed, sort of goes from smaller on the top to larger at the bottom. And one of the things that you that will discover or that you do discover when you look at native uh, trees here in Sonoma County, there are not very many smaller sized native trees, which is why I've included some large shrubs um, on this list. Uh, because if you have a very small lot in Santa Rosa and uh, you don't have the capacity to put in a native oak tree, typically just because of your um, landscape space. And so, uh, the use of multiple large shrubs is, is a good alternative. So this is uh, at the beginning of my list of species I'm going to talk about. This is really a shrub. These first um, several of these are shrubs per se, as opposed to um, true trees. Um, the good thing is, is that most all of these shrubs are, are uh, aggressively prunable. If you want to shape it so that it looks more like a standard tree, you certainly can do that. You'll see an example of my attempt to do that um, with the uh, Fremontodendron in a few slides. Um, this is the California Snowdrop, Styrax ridivivus. Um, this is an uncommon shrub that, but is available commercially. Uh, blooms early in the spring. Uh, um, hummingbirds, uh, butterflies. Uh, I, I believe I even have seen reports that um, 
our pipe vine swallowtail um, will nectar um, on these blooms um, in the springtime. Service berry. Um, now, um, Amelanchier, uh, the genus, there are a myriad of uh, service berry species that grow throughout the western part of the United States. This particular one, I think, is referred to as the Saskatoon service berry. Um, and so it clearly grows all the way up into Canada, this species. But this species is available at local native uh, plant nurseries here. Um, the service berry uh, um, is no, it's grown commercially for fruit. It will make a fruit. The, the, the bloom in the springtime is good for pollinators. And then the fruit is good for, for um, birds um, in later in the summer and into the fall. Uh, and um, these are even grown for human consumption. They taste like blueberries. Garia elliptica, this is really a coastal plant primarily. If you plant this inland, it will survive in Sonoma County, but you'll need to give it some shade. Um, these, uh, uh, this is not a pollinator plant per se, uh, because these are pollinated by wind with these long catkins, um, but it certainly is a dramatic look for your garden. And one of the things uh, to remember is that any plant or tree or shrub that has a catkin um, is a great nest builder uh, for birds and other critters. Um, chamise is really a, a plant that is has some level of controversy. It grows all over the state of California. It is a, a, a dominant plant in a lot of the chaparral uh, biomes, but it is uh, fire prone. It, there is, it, has a, it has an oil in the leaves, much like a eucalyptus would have oil in the leaves. And so it certainly is prone to burning. Um, although they say that if you keep this watered, it is not as prone to burn. Prunus virginiana, choke cherry. And you remember from that slide, one of the most important genera um, in native trees is prunus. Uh, this is the prunus that is really native here to Sonoma County, to the North Bay. Uh, and it's native over much of the United States, this choke cherry, as you can tell from the name Virginiana. Uh, it also grows on the East Coast. Um, you can see that this is great bird food in the fall uh, for birds. Uh, and, uh, you know, it'll have a little panicle of of blooms for pollinators in the springtime. And this is available commercially. Now you will see Prunus alicifolia, which is not native to Sonoma County. It is native from the San Francisco Bay all the way south to Baja, California. Um, but it will, it will fruit much like the, the, the choke cherry. Um, so it does provide bird food, and this is this is widely available uh, in um, the landscape uh, business. And as climate change shifts, maybe your growing conditions, um, this prunus from Southern California might likely be more appropriate here. Uh, in the northern part of the state if uh, as our temperature rises. Now, we have vocabulary class, a short vocabulary class this morning. Two new words, they might be new words for you, congeners and nativars. Well, a congener is a member of the same taxonomic genus, the member, two members of the same genus, like we just saw with the two prunus, elicifolia, and Virginiana. The, 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 the question and the research that is ongoing and is undecided, unproven, unquantified is if I plant that uh, another member of the same genus in a non-native location, how much habitat benefit am I going to get from that? Logic would tell you 
it certainly should be way more than a non-native plant, but how close does it come to the native species in terms of wildlife support? We're really not certain of that yet. Uh, native ours is a new word. Uh, uh, you know, we've got native plants, but then we have a lot of uh, nursery trade uh, um, cultivars that have the parentage of the native species, but then are reproduced, reproduced mostly by clones. So they're not uh, reproducing in the natural fashion in the wild. And the question is, again, how much uh, um, benefit will we get, will native insects get from a, a native R as opposed to the original native species? And I can tell you that I did just read an interview with um, Doug Tallamy, and it, one of the things that he shared it, in terms of research going on in this area is that um, one of the things that they have distinctly noticed is that if you take that native plant and you create a new cultivar that has a different color leaf, changes the leaf from green to yellow or orange in some sort of fashion, the native insects will not uh, use those as a host plant. Um, and that's probably chemical related to uh, whatever causes th that uh, color change in that cultivar. And uh, here we are to an example of the, of the congeners. Um, this is the uh, Hawthorn Cretaceous that is native here to Sonoma County, native here, woodland, Sonoma County, native here to Sonoma County and all the way up into Oregon and Washington. Um, bloom in the spring, pollinator supporter, bird food in the winter. Uh, you will have, this is available commercially, but you'll have more difficulty finding that. This is in my garden, which is a European hawthorn, not native to the States. Um, very available in the nursery trade. But I can only tell you from my own personal experience, I planted this before I was fully into native trees and plants um, in my front yard, that you know it does make that little red fruit and um, both cedar wax wings and mockingbirds clean the fruit off this tree in the winter time. So there clearly is some overlap of wildlife support um, with this congener, another species of the same genus from another location planted here in Sonoma County. Circocarpus spetuloides, um, the mountain mahogany, sort of a misnomer. It's not a mahogany and it really doesn't grow that much in the mountains. Um, although you certainly see it in the Sierra foothills. Um, it's a compact little tree. It has very hard wood. Native Americans use this specifically for arrows, hunting, fishing, um, woodworking, anything that they needed a, 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 a hard wood for. Um, and so it has a really great place in our sort of native landscape here. The one thing is it is deer candy. So if you, if you live in an area where you have a high deer population, this might not be a good selection or you would have to give it some immense protection till it gets large enough. But again, this is, a, we, you know, we're looking at small trees here still. Here's our Western redbud and, um, you know, Circe's occidentalis. And um, uh, we just had a conversation, uh, just had a conversation with one of our other master gardeners before we started this webinar and, uh, you know, frequently these smaller trees uh, grow as multi-trunked shrubs. And, um, but they can also, if pruned, can become a large tree. Um, we think that this is the world champion Western redbud. It is here in the JC neighborhood um, in Santa Rosa. Um, and as you can see, this is a, there's a two-story house over here to the left. You know, so this is probably a 35, 40 feet foot tall uh, Western redbud. It is by far and away the largest I've ever seen here. 
This is in my garden uh, of Fremontodendron uh, californica, uh, the western flannel bush. Um, and this is, this is a large shrub that in its natural form would be as wide as it is tall. And it supposedly is not amenable to pruning. But you can see that I have been whacking away at that bottom because I'm trying to make it more upright tree shaped and less wide multi-trunked um, at the base. Uh, maybe the most beautiful native uh, shrub that you can grow here in Northern California. Um, these buttery um, yellow to orange blooms are wonderful in the springtime. And this is the time that my bee population really pops out of winter hibernation. Elderberry, uh, the genus Sambucus, uh, Sambucus nigra, native here to uh, Sonoma County, uh, over much of California, actually, Sambucus nigra. There's also a subspecies, um, Cerulea, which is the blue elderberry, same species, different subspecies, different colored fruit. Um, you can, this will also make fruit for birds in the winter, uh, which is really its primary goal. And it is not pollinated by bees, it's pollinated by flies. So as you think about that web of creatures that you're trying to support in the garden, this fills another little niche uh, that you might not otherwise have in your garden space. We talked about that word a native R earlier. This is that same species with a cultivar, black lace. This is in my garden. Fancy, it's beautiful. The vegetation when it opens in the springtime, that black color, it eventually turns more green over time, but again, um, creates fruit. Um, I don't think it does not fruit nearly as well uh, as the straight species. And I think that's one of the drawbacks that you get uh, with the use of these uh, nursery trade cultivars. They, they aesthetically might be more beautiful, but they are likely less uh, usable uh, by the wildlife uh, um, in terms of uh, habitat support. Arctostaphylus, manzanitas, I think everybody's garden should have a manzanita. Every, you know, even the smallest garden can use a manzanita. Um, some species grow upright, uh, you know, we, and we also know that there are lower growing manzanitas that um, can act as a, a tall ground cover. Um, this is one of the, er manzanita will be one of the earliest bloomers in the springtime. Uh, so it will be one of the earliest uh, food sources for native bees, and, uh, and then it uh, converts to the little fruits. They'll turn red. That's how it gets the name manzanita for little apple. Um, and then, of course, those can be eaten by uh, birds at the end of the growing season. There are dozens of manzanita. Let me rephrase that. Let me say, say that again. There are dozens of Arctostaphylus species. Um, Arctostaphylus manzanita being sort of the, what people might refer to as straight manzanitas. Um, Arctostaphylus also crossbreeds readily from species to species. So there is an almost infinite var variety uh, of species uh, of manzanita. And I love this. I took this photograph accidentally um, I was just trying to get a close up as I was getting ready to give a presentation and it was just starting to bloom. I think this is in, a, in January, uh, a couple of winters ago. And it wasn't until I blew up the photograph that I saw those little egg sacs on the leaf. And, um, you know, it was one of those sort of aha moments like, oh yeah, this is why we're planting natives in the garden because the insects use these as host plants um, for the next generation. Uh, of insects. Uh, next, you're going to see a series of three um, species of dogwood. Um, uh, Ceraceae um, is the smallest of them. This is a variegated varietal from my garden. 
I've lost the paperwork, so I don't even know what varietal it is anymore. Um, and I planted it because it has the lovely little red twigs in the winter when it, when it drops its leaves, and I can see that out my bedroom window. Um, so it's a little visual addition of wintertime for me. Um, this is the wettest of these three dogwoods. Um, so it would probably only really do well um, in the western part of, of Sonoma County uh, and not the drier, hotter eastern parts. Um, all of these dogwoods will do with a little shade. This is a brown dogwood. Um, and this is a new species to me, um, for me, relatively new species. Um, but it's a medium sized tree. It can grow most anywhere here in Sonoma County if you give it a little shade um, and requires uh, uh, lower water than the Ceraceae that we just saw previously. And then you go all the way to the largest um, California native dogwood, um, Natalia, uh, which you're typically only going to see as you get to the inland hills, um, the inland mountain ranges, and then move on to the foothills of the Sierra. Um, where you will see them in increased frequency. Um, and, and again, this is the largest of these three dogwoods. And, and you know, these will get uh, 20 to 30 feet tall at maturity, uh, but requires little water, uh, but does like some shade. Uh, Polodiscus discolor, uh, cream bush. It's a, 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 a shrub that you can grow most anywhere here in, in Sonoma County. Um, notable specifically for this uh, lovely little uh, fluff of uh, bloom in the springtime, um, which uh, pollinators do use. If you happened, the lead slide that Nancy had up uh, when we started the day is, is a close up of one of these uh, blooms, uh, you know, which has thousands of those little tiny little white blossoms uh, for pollinators to feed on. Uh, the California wax myrtle, Morella, is um, generally, you're probably only going to see this successful um, in the western half of the county. Um, it likes a little bit of a cooler climate, a little more moisture. Um, if you, you could certainly grow this inland um, in Santa Rosa or in the Valley of the Moon, um, but if I planted that inland, I would uh, give it a little shade if you have that opportunity. And, and you can just, if you look at this, uh, you know, and this is another of these large shrubs that you can fashion into a small tree because if you would have pruned off those lower branches down at the ground, um, you can see how that would make, you can create a small tree form out of a large shrub. Salix, um, willows. Uh, this is, some, this is uh, one of those uh, four foundational uh, native tree genus, genera, and, uh, but probably the least likely for uh, a homeowner to plant in their garden space. Willows tend to uh, grow only in riparian areas. So if you do happen to live near a creek, near a stream, I have the good fortune of having a seasonal creek, you know, water runoff behind my property that comes down the side of a hill. Um, and I have uh, like three different species of willows that grow in that area behind the fence. They keep trying to creep over my fence, um, but I know that those are great habitat plants back there. Um, California buckeye, uh, I think we all pretty well know those. Um, and before uh, a question might come about the uh, toxicity of the European honeybee to the pollen of the California buckeye, yes, those facts do exist. Um, but the European honeybee will steer clear of the pollen on your California buckeye if you have other bloom sources available in your garden for that European honeybee. And you notice that I say, every time I say honeybee, I say European honeybee because that is a non-native bee. Um, 
but those are bees that are important to us agriculturally, uh, commercially. Um, so we certainly don't want to uh, harm those populations. You're gonna see two maples here. Um, the Acer macrophylla, the big leaf maple. Um, it's one of my favorites um, here in Sonoma County. I get to see a few as I drive up the hill toward Fountain Grove from my house in the woodland. Um, they typically grow as understory trees. W one of their most remarkable features is that um, they have a brilliant yellow fall color. Um, if anybody has ever been to uh, Armstrong Woods uh, State Park in the month of November, typically, uh, when the floor of Armstrong Woods is covered with these giant yellow leaves is really a spectacular vision. Um, I included this uh, Acer circinatum, which is technically not native here to Sonoma County. Um, it is native Mendocino County northward all the way um, to Canada. Uh, typically grows in the understory, um, in the woodland setting, um, but it's a beautiful tree and it can be used. Uh, it will it will tolerate um, fairly full sun if it gets a little supplemental water in the summertime. And I use this as a recommendation for folks who are really um, sort of bent on the look of a Japanese maple. Um, and so I think that this particular species fills a niche for commonly used landscape plants. Um, and so at least it is um, native adjacent, uh, a near native, so to speak. And we, ha we have, uh, this is not, this is another Acer, uh, Nagundo. Uh, it's, it's commonly called box elder. It's really in the maple. Uh, genus, it's a large shade tree. Um, and it is a tree that requires water. If you would happen to have that little patch of lawn um, that you are really hesitant to get rid of, and you wanted to put a shade tree uh, in, its, in that space, uh, this might be your choice because it tolerates the water, uh, unlike most of our native oaks, that uh, would not tolerate their roots being wet in the summertime. And of course, as under, as all things, uh, you know, the, um, the nursery trade has come up with a diminutive form of Acer Nagundo that's called Flamingo that you can get commercially that you see the size of that tree would work in anybody's, uh, you know, small front yard. Um, the question again is how much benefit are we going to get from that from a habitat support standpoint? We don't know all the answers to those questions yet. And I think I'll take a stop there, Nancy, if you wanna clear up any questions. Yeah, um, here's one I forgot to ask last time. Um, Jerry wants to know, can you discuss fire safety with respect to native tree varieties? Yeah. I can. <laughs> I guess will will you? Would I, 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 you? Well, I, I hesitate to talk too much about it because there is so much information and disinformation and sketchy information. Uh, you know, people are so focused on trying to prevent, uh, 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 you know, to try to, um, you know, create a fire safe landscape or a more fire safe landscape around your home. Um, and uh, none of these trees that I'm talking about are particularly more flammable um, than others, so to speak. And, you know, the key is uh, from a fire safe perspective is to keep these large trees away from your house. I, I mean, that's really the best advice that I can give. Follow the guidance for dispensable space. Yeah, keep the defensible space around your house. And, um, you know, and, and that's really hard to do um, in many homes 
I mean, I have a giant Chinese elm tree that I inherited that hangs over the back corner of my house. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful tree and I hesitate to take it down just because it is so beautiful and it provides shade for a lot of natives that I have growing underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, those, those are tough questions for homeowners, it really is. Okay, um, and um, this is kind of a follow-up to the soil question. We live in a subdivision with backfill soil, not very healthy soil. I, I know I myself have the same problem. Um, what do we do to soil to allow natives to grow? Yeah, when, when you don't know exactly where that backfill came from or how it's been treated, um, I, I guess my best recommendation would be um, rather than amending it when you're planting, I would amend the soil in the years before you do the planting. So that, you know, if you need to increase the fertility of that soil and give it a better tilth, um, do it before you put that um, native plant in the ground, not when you put the native plant in the ground. So you're talking about adding compost? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's that, that's what I'm talking about is, you know, using comp compost and, you know, carbon-based, you know, you're putting carbon in the ground using compost in the same manner that trees put carbon in the ground. Right. Okay. Um, and then um, another Nancy has a question. Will, deers, will deer be attracted to all the shrubs you mentioned that have berries? You know, deer are less berry eaters than other critters. I'd be, if I lived someplace where there were bears, I'd be more concerned about the bears eating the berries than the deer. Um, deer, deer are really, are foragers that will eat a lot of different things. Um, but the thing is, is that the additional uh, uh, thought is that uh, the size of the deer population that we have here Mm -hmm. in in Sonoma County anything over four feet off the ground they're not going to get to so you know if you have a shrub that's 10 foot tall they're not going to get at that fruit yeah I had that experience where I lived before we had a, a ton of deer and um, I found that roses I could do climbing roses because once they got above a certain height they the deer couldn't get them yeah, so. yeah. I, I, deer do really love blooms um, I, I'm, I, from my information, they are less drawn to fruit than blooms. Mm, interesting. Okay. Um, and then, um, Deborah has a question, which plants allow the most biodiversity, which have the greatest benefit? Um, and I would go back and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to visit a website that will help answer those questions. Great. Um, but I go back to those four, um, genera that I mentioned the, the top four genera, the, the, you know, the oak, the prunus, um, the willow and the populace. Um, and one of the things, it was a concept that, um, I was supposed to include on one of the earlier slides is that, uh, you know, you 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 uh, you go to presentations, you go to lectures, you you know you go to stores, and they will sell you a um, a bee hotel mm -hmm. or an insect hotel, and um, the concept that I want people to think about with these native large native shrubs and trees is that that is nature's insect hotel. Cool. So that if you put these natives in your garden you won't need those other, uh, those other things uh, in your garden space to help populate insects. Great, okay. And I think that's it for now. Okay, and we will move on. I'm about uh, three quarters of the way through here uh, because we're getting to the larger trees that are native here to Sonoma County. And again, um, you know, the, the challenge is uh, where to put some of these um, in terms of uh, uh, given the size of our uh, landscapes, our home landscapes, um, if we live in an urban suburban sort of place. 
Uh, this is the um, Oregon ash, which is uh, technically uh, um, native here in Sonoma County, from Sonoma County to the north toward Washington and Oregon. And so as you could see, it will probably, it will require more water, although, you know, any of these trees that, that on the spreadsheet, or if you look up their information, say that um, they need moderate water, uh, once they are established and if their roots are firmly down in the ground where there is more moisture, uh, they will, most of them become drought tolerant. Now, I have just recently discovered this California ash, which if you do, a, uh, you do some searches for native trees in Sonoma County, this doesn't show up. Although if you do a search in Napa or Lake or Yolo counties, this will show up. In the hills, in the inland hills, um, it's very drought tolerant. It's a great habitat uh, uh, tree um, with, with these lovely little blooms. If you see a full one of these, um, it turns a lovely white in the springtime when it blooms, um, the California ash. And, and grows in the southern, uh, basically the, the, all of the hills that surround the Central Valley, you will find um, this native California ash. We do have the native black walnut. Uh, I include it here just because it's always on people's native plant lists um, for Sonoma County and the North Bay. Uh, it does create those black walnuts, which from my understanding are not the best flavored walnuts in the world. So the fruit is sort of uh, uh, a sidebar. Um, it also, ex it, it evidently it, it, it exudes a uh, compound uh, that makes gardening underneath them a challenge. So it's really not very high on my uh, list of recommendations for anybody's garden, um, but it exists in the wild. Uh, you know, if you hike through the woods, you're gonna see these black walnut trees. Um, Arbutus menziesii, it is the Arbutus that is native here to Sonoma County, native all up and down the coast. Um, you can find uh, the Pacific Madrone as far north as uh, British Columbia, as far south as Santa Barbara. Now, the difference that you're gonna see in that range is how large this tree will get. Um, in British Columbia, it is a large tree, you know, the size of a big oak tree. Um, in Santa Barbara, it's a shrub. Um, and that's just based upon water, uh, water availability. And, um, they really are beautiful. If you wanted to grow it in your garden, I, I would try to grow it as an under, uh, understory uh, if you had some high shade. Um, and uh, the Pacific Madrone is has been notorious uh, for being a non-friendly sort of home gardener, novice gardener uh, planting to put in. Um, there's a couple of alders. Uh, you know, alders are in the in the birch family. Um, and uh, there's a, I believe it's a white alder, I can't remember the species, which um, is also native here to Sonoma County. Um, larger tree, uh, good habitat support, and um, uh, mod moderately drought tolerant. And now we're, you know, now we're to the oaks and, you know, we have dozens of native oaks that you can grow here in Sonoma County. Um, I'm just gonna touch on some of them um, this is Gariana, the Oregon oak, um, which is uh, in the white oak lineage, which uh, you'll learn the importance of that. So this is a great, if you wanted to plant a native oak, this is a great one. This is the coast live oak, um, which, is, which is a dominant uh, tree uh, in the coastal setting from Sonoma County all the way to Southern California. Um, uh, you will see more coast live oaks than uh, most any tree in uh, much of the Sonoma County woodland. Um, it is susceptible to sudden oak death, which is the only drawback. And of course, it, as you can see, it also can be a very large tree. Um, and it is a mod, it has a modest growth rate um, as opposed to the valley oak, which has a fast growth rate 
Um, and, you know, this is the, the Quercus lobata. Um, lobata is the largest oak tree in North America. Um, this photograph that I have here is a photo that I took. That's at uh, Jack London State Park. You know, this is the old big giant valley oak outside uh, Jack London's old uh, riding cabin that they've been arguing about taking down because it's, you know, reaching the end of its life. But from my perspective, any removal of that tree would be a crime against uh, nature. And we have the blue oak. And this is, a, this is an oak tree that I, um, I suggest people think about uh, for their home garden if they're really intent on putting a native oak in. Um, it's very slow growing. Um, it will be your children's children who probably have to remove it for because it has grown too large uh, for your space. It literally grows inches per year. Um, it is drought tolerant. Um, the, whether it is summer water tolerant, I think is an argument. You see some sources, some resources that say yes, some that say no, but it is um, sudden oak death resistant. And uh, I can't really talk about native trees uh, in Sonoma County with at least having a quick little refresher um, for sudden oak death. Um, most of you are probably familiar with this uh, issue. Uh, the, the pathogen Phytophthora ramorum um, came to California a few decades ago. Uh, it colonizes, it's, the, the fungus causes leaf blight on many California species. Um, you'll find, uh, if you find a, like a native coffee berry uh, a shrub that you know, has a little brown tip of its leaves, that is probably caused by Phytophthora. Um, but it doesn't kill most species. Um, there are only a, a few things that it causes death. Now, um, one of our uh, native trees, and there are a lot of them in Sonoma County, um, is our native bay tree, Umbellaria. Umbellaria. And uh, I, took, I snapped these photographs. Um, this was Oh, the Tubbs fire was in 2017. So this would have been in the summer of 2018. As you watch these California bays regrow, this is the, the downhill, the northeast uh, side of Fountain Grove down toward Reebley Valley, um, where you, know, you can see them sprouting back um, from the root crowns and growing. Now, the unfortunate thing, it, you know, our native bays, they're beautiful trees. They smell lovely, um, but they are also the primary dispenser of disease for sudden oak death. It will, the, the California Bay will not die from sudden oak death. It only reproduces the fungal spores and sends them out to kill the other trees. And the, the California tan oak, the tan oak, Notholithocarpus, which is not an oak tree, it's not a true oak tree, despite the fact that the leaves look like an oak tree and it makes an acorn. You know, the, uh, the, the Carl Linnaean uh, classification system sometimes escapes the logical part of my brain. Um, it's technically not an oak tree, um, but it is the, probably the largest sufferer um, from sudden oak death here in the no North Bay. Um, and in fact, it is the only tree that can harbor the disease, reproduce the disease, and kill itself, which is really a bad, bad trifecta when it comes to sudden oak death. Now, we do have other California native oaks that are potential victims of sudden oak death. The most common um, in our area would be the coast live oak. Uh, all oaks genetically either uh, um, are in the lineage of white oaks versus red oaks. And anything that is in the red oak lineage is susceptible to sudden oak death. Um, the white oaks are seemingly uh, um, resistant. That includes the valley oak, Quercus lobata, and Quercus gariana, the Oregon oak. And so, if, if those, that's why I included those two specifically. 
in this presentation. And we get back to the blue oak, which again is in that white oak lineage. So it is sod, sudden oak death resistant. Um, and now we're to the really, really giant trees. And, um, you know, uh, uh, on that earlier slide about the four important um, genera, uh, populace was one of them. And uh, you frequently don't think of, of cottonwood trees um, being uh, very frequent here in Sonoma County. I live um, in a semi-riparian area. There's a creek just down the street from my house. And um, if we walk down the street right now into that, uh, where that, along that creek, uh, I could pick out probably 50 cottonwood trees um, in about 10 minutes. Um, and so despite the fact that they do require more water, um, it's clearly there's no water in that creek in the summertime, um, but they do very well um, in those particular microclimates. And then of course we get, you know, Sequoia sempervirens, our, you know, giant coast redwood, the tallest tree in the world. And then um, we all know about those. And, you know, these, are, these large trees are more than often, you know, too much to think about in your home garden, unless you really have a, a sizable property in the appropriate environment for them. And, and then you've got the Doug fir, which is the second tallest, you know, uh, um, conifer um, in North America, uh, many of which were taken out by logging. Um, but there, uh, its native range um, goes down as far south in California as I believe uh, Big Sur, and then north um, up, up the coast of California into Oregon and Washington. Um, a couple of things about trying to grow natives in general, uh, and specifically some of these native trees, um, they grow slowly. Uh, patience is, is uh, not always one of my best virtues, but it is something that you really sort of need to uh, um, keep in mind uh, if you start trying to increase the natives in your garden. Um, you know, the, the manzanitas that I have in my garden are now about, the oldest ones are about five years old. And it took about five years for them to really get established so that they would have a full bloom cycle uh, when they bloom in January, February, March, and then create fruit. Um, uh, so all many natives, I won't say all natives, many natives, you need to have that patience. Uh, we do have the great um, uh, benefit of having um, a great uh, native plant nursery here in Sonoma County. Um, and I've given you uh, three choices that you might find some of these natives I've talked about today um, available commercially. And um, I'm gonna try to quickly show you a few of these websites. Um, Calflora and Calscape are run by the California Native Plant Society. They are great searchable websites um, that you can use. The uh, nature.berkeley is um, UC's um, sudden oak death related website. If that's something that's of particular interest to you, you want to stay up to date on that. Um, and these, the last two uh, links on here are um, for um, the Doug Tallamy website, which I recently discovered, and the National Wildlife Fund Native Plant Finder, where we're going to talk about which genus and species are best suited for habitat support. I'm going to stop sharing that. Uh oh. It won't let me share, Nancy. Oh, no, now it is. Never mind. Okay. I, I don't know what that was all about. Um, here is um, the most recently. Oh. Do you see that? I'm getting a new window I've never seen before, Nancy, that says who can share only host all panelists. We, we see the start a new habit. Yeah. We see your desktop. Do you see the Doug Tallamy website? We can do this one person at a time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I it's see not, it. it. It's not on my screen, so I can't see it at all. So I, uh, there's something weird with the, sh with the shared screen thing. Um, this is the Doug Tallamy website um, that I talked about that I really just discovered. Um, if you scroll through there, you will see um, he'll have lectures, presentations about native plants um, and how you might get involved in this, uh, the, his new concept about homegrown national parks in your backyard, which I think is a great little concept. Okay, I'm gonna try to share. Um, this is the weird thing is that I can't get at my, I can't see the screen to manipulate this, Nancy. I don't know why. Oh, oh, that's frustrating. Okay, well, we see we see the native plants by zip code, flowers and grasses. Yeah, and but uh, but I, no, hang on. I oh, I'm 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 apologetic to people for this. Um, okay, I managed to find my way here. Um, so. You can see up in the corner here, now I'm getting at the screen, 95404, which is my zip code and I've already done that. You can see that it's already there. And when I search, search on that, oh, what happened? Anyway, okay. So by zip code, 95404, you see up in the corner, which is my zip code. Here we have flowers and grasses. These are ranked by the National Wildlife Fund on the, um, the quantity of habitat support for each genus. And this first section is flowers and grasses where lupin is at the top of the list. And as you scroll down to trees and shrubs, what did we, what did we talk about earlier? The four most important, willow, oak, prunus, and populus. And, and you can see what's, you know, what right behind there in, you know, we talked about alders is in the number six position. And we talked about, you know, maples, which is in the number eight position. Um, and it will do that for all of these uh, uh, species and tell you which are most uh, productive in terms of share of, um, habitat support. Oh. That window that's talking about who can share is really messing with me, Nancy. Okay. We have the link to the native plants by zip code in our resources. Yeah, and well, and I, I was trying to go to Calscape to show, but and, and now I've lost my Zoom share screen. I hate it when technology gets the best of me. Definitely. Yeah, I will. We'll take whatever questions are left, Nancy, because I'm not going. I don't think I'm going to be capable of pulling that up. What I was going to show was the Calscape um, website, and I had pulled up um, that uh, the Prunus virginiana, um, uh, in particular, uh, uh, species. And I, what I wanted to show them was that you know when you put in the genus and species and you search. Oh, you're, we've got Calscape up now. Oh, and now it's there. Oh, yeah. And I didn't click on anything besides. I, I'm sharing it, Bill. Oh, oh you're okay. sharing it. Just tell me where to go. Okay. So you're not seeing me scroll down the page. Yeah, I just saw somebody scroll down the page. Okay, it, it, it's me. It's me, I think. Okay, so no. this is the Calscape website. And, um, for each species, you will, you know, you'll get a description of, of the species. You will even get nursery information, potentially, where you might locate that particular plant, how fast it grows, watering needs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
but here's one of the things that I wanted to show you. If you if you scroll down here and if you can see the screen that says butterflies and moths posted, you know, and this is a prunus. Oh, okay. 46 confirmed, 46 species of butterflies and moths that use that species as a host plant. Wow. And 122 more likely use it as a host species. Yeah, this, these, these are the, the biggest numbers that you're going to see are on willows, oaks, prunus. It's just the, it's, that, that's just the absolute truth. And that's really all I have to say, Nancy. If, do we have any more questions? Um, there's, there's a chat about, do you mean Cal, yeah, Calscape. Calflora is a nursery, Calscape is a resource. So. There is also calflora.org, which is part of, but it, the, the calflora.org, which is not the nursery. Okay. But it's also run by um, California Native Plant Society. And it is searchable and you can create lists of native plants for where you live. Native trees, native shrubs, grasses, whatever you're looking for. The thing that Calscape has that is more helpful is that it gives you all of these growing conditions and descriptors and things to avoid and which needs more water and which, you know, and things, to, you know, as you scroll down, it'll even give you suggestions of what to plant with that tree. Wow. So um, it, it, it has more detailed information for, um, for gardeners, the Calscape website. Yeah. Great, well, we don't have any other questions. Um, so I just wanna re reassure everybody that um, the links and everything will be available on our website. Um, we'll send a lot of those to you with our follow-up email that includes the link to access the recording. Um, and I want to thank you, Bill, for Nancy, your- Nancy, there's a new question in the question box. Oh, OK. Um, oh, OK. Would you please speak a little about planting oaks and the care for them in the first two years? Well, and, uh, and this is really um, not specific to oaks per se. Um, you know, one of the mistakes and, and uh, particular, particularly for um, uh, uh, a gardener with less experience is that, you know, you plant these trees and shrubs, even perennials that are drought tolerant, that tolerate low water um, and they will survive on that once they are established. But the, the questioner is correct in that those first couple years, um, you are going to have to take additional steps to get these things established. You know, now you certainly do not, a native oak, you do not want to be over watering by any stretch of the imagination in the summertime. But um, in those first couple of years, particularly until we've had a couple of decent rainy seasons for them to get their feet settled, um, you're going to require some additional water to get those th th that uh, big root system established. Uh, Bill, I wanted to mention a couple of things about the Firewise. I put a, the resources on there. Um, the Sonoma Master Gardeners are part of the Resilient uh, Landscapes Coalition, and I put all the links there with our web presentations and our content, particularly on native landscapes and firewise and defensible space. Uh, you could also find that information on our web page. I put all those links in the chat box. And, and thank you for that, Cleo. It's one of the reasons that I didn't want to get too far into the weeds in terms of um, Firewise uh, recommendations. I, I've seen other. I've seen that the county of Marin has like put out this lengthy "do not plant" list, which excludes almost all the natives from the plant list because you know they say they're you know too high fire danger. Well, 
I mean, that's penny wise and pound foolish from my perspective. Yeah. Um, okay, so maybe the landscape won't burn, but it's gonna be sterile. Yeah, our recommendation is the right plant in the right place, considering fire defensible space within the five foot zone, the zero to 30 zone and the uh, 30 to 100 and natives. And uh, the truth is all plants will burn. It doesn't Absolutely. matter what they are. The issue is how do you maintain them and how do you um, limb them up and how do you avoid uh, uh, fuel, ladder fuels and such. All that information is in our presentations and in the, I put a, also a, um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Is that, that a real doorbell? doorbell? <laughs> so um, that information is there, and we will send that also in the email that we send you as a follow up. So, Nancy, hit. I'm stepping back now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Cleo. I appreciate that. So, um, any other questions I need to answer, Nancy? Oh, it looks like there's a new one. Um, oh, it says, please mention box elders are fast growing and great shade trees, but short lived and prone to large branches breaking off box elder bugs. Yeah, yeah and, and yes, and um, uh, 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 let me, ooh, that's probably another, um, maybe we can include that. I will have to include that, um, so that you so that we can send that to all the participants a new website um, that our climate forward tree group um, has happened upon to is a website created by i think it's uc san luis obispo um, that's called select tree that includes branch strength sure. for species so that you can do that research um, you know and there certainly are trees uh, and there are native trees that have branching that are that are weaker than others and that certainly can be a consideration um i didn't use that as part of my consideration for today's presentation because we are so limited in the in the sheer number limited number of trees that are native uh, to sonoma county well this is d what was that website again oh i and i don't know it by heart i'll have to Google it here. Um, it's select tree uh, yeah, I, I, dot 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 dot. <laughs> and where is it from? Yeah, uh, I I just don't have it in front of me mm -hmm. to link you to it. But but we'll get that and we'll send that to everybody because that it and it's also a searchable. Um, uh, it, it is a searchable index, much like the Calscape website is searchable. Um, and we have, because it includes some other things in terms of um, pests, you know, the bugs and the borers and the, the branch strength is information that they specifically include um, in there. Uh, you can do a search and you can exclude all the trees with weak limbs. Um, so, so, so it's a nice little tool. I'll have to, um, I'll get that to you guys so that you can forward that in the email that goes to everybody who attended today. Thank you. Um, Bill, I put the link in the chat and in the answer. It's select tree Cal Poly. Thank you. I, 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 and I knew that Cal Poly was involved in that name and then it's a .edu at the end, is it not? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, um, our uh, Climate Forward Tree Group, um, you know, stumbled onto that in our conversations with um, native um, master gardeners in the southern half of the state. Evidently, they all knew about that website. None of us knew about it. Excuse me, it sounds like a great resource. It, it's just another tool in the shed, so to speak. OK, well, it looks like all the questions are taken care of. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again and let you know about some upcoming events. So, excuse me, um, Veggie Happenings is continuing and we have our next one this coming Tuesday. 
So they're going to talk about how to put your garden to bed if you don't want to have a fall garden. So that'll involve um, cover cropping. And then also um, we're going to get a great tour of the Kendall Jackson Culinary um, Gardens from Tucker Taylor, who's a master gardener and also the head, the head culinary gardener there. And then um, the master food preservers are going to show us how to make pumpkin butter. So if you've been growing pumpkins, this might be something that you want to do. Right now, you can't can pumpkin butter, but they'll show us what to do with it. You can't can it safely anyway. Um, and then I also wanted to let you know that our succulent sales have returned. So uh, next weekend, um, you can go Saturday or Sunday to the Jail Industries um, site. It will have succulents for sale and the Jail Industries group will have veggie starts and native plants for sale. And if you can't make that sale, but you're still interested, you can also go make an appointment and all the information for all of those sales is on our website. So a reminder that our information desk is always available for questions. You can email your questions, send us a picture of the problem with your plant that's bugging you and uh, you'll get scientifically based answers and um, recommendations on how you should handle it. And um, let's see, I think that's about it. We've provided um, a number of resources and links in the chat. And of course you'll also get those um, when you get the um, link for the recording. So we hope that this presentation helps you choose and maintain appropriate trees native to the Sonoma County for your yard and uh, increase the habitat one garden at a time.